Hello and a very warm welcome to this webinar hosted by Delta Energy and Environment on the topic of microgrids. My name is John Murray and I'm a principal analyst here at Delta and I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, Scott Dwyer and Matthew Myers. You can say hello. Hi. Morning, <laughs> afternoon everyone. <laughs> Um, both Matt and myself have been working very closely on the topic of microgrids uh, since the start of this year. Uh, we've been undertaking detailed research that has fed into the microgrids multi-client study which was published earlier this month. And during the course of this webinar today we'll be presenting some of the highlights from this study. Uh, Scott is working very closely with our energy storage team and will be contributing some of his insights throughout the webinar also. And, of course, microgrids and energy storage are very closely linked, so it's good to have Scott with us here today. So, very briefly, what shall we be discussing today? Um, well, we'll quickly recap on what we mean by microgrids and why we are looking at them uh, as a business. Um, we will then be talking about one of the most sophisticated microgrids in the world. Uh, we'll then move on to talking about some of the trends that we're seeing towards hybridization and vertical integration within the microgrid and wider energy space um, before moving on finally to a recommendation from our microgrids multi-client study. Um, so some brief housekeeping before we get started. We intend to talk for about 30 minutes today with a further 5 to 10 minutes at the end for questions. If you wish to ask any questions throughout the webinar, please do so. We really would like to encourage some interaction from everyone on the webinar today. Um, you should have uh, a box on the right-hand side of your screen in which you can write down and submit your questions. Um, you can do that at any point, and we will come back to those at the end. So, moving on, and just for those of you that don't know us, I think most of you do, but um, just for those that are unfamiliar with Delta, I'll hand over to my colleague Scott quickly just to introduce Delta and who we are. Thanks, John. So, Delta is a leading provider of research and consulting services. And we really see it as our mission to help our clients navigate this profound transformation we're seeing in the energy system. So that's going from this uh, past situation with very centralized power generation, very much about commodity sales. Customers were merely meter points and a lot of the value was in the, uh, upstream. And we're moving towards a place where there's much more distributed energy, uh, renewables on the grids, much more about services being offered to customers and where much of the value is now being generated downstream. We work mainly with major <coughs> energy utilities, suppliers, network operators, as well as the energy product manufacturers uh, and heated product manufacturers. And companies typically come to Delta um, when they're looking for an independent viewpoint from somebody who understands the markets, the products, the customers, the business models, or looking at entering new markets, um, or finding looking for information that is reliable and perhaps have been asked to make critical decisions on. So a little bit about Delta and uh, some of the uh, some of the areas we work in. And you can just see a, a select example of the, the types of clients who work on from Europe. Asia, North America, and, and elsewhere. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Scott. So, um, moving on to the the topic at hand today, microgrids. Um, so, what do we mean by microgrid? I mean, maybe that's the first uh, question to start off with today. Um, and of course, different people have different definitions for what a microgrid is. Um, and uh, well, this is one of the first questions that we set out to ask ourselves, actually, when we started looking at this topic um, a couple of years back. Um, and, yeah, if you ask 10 different people what the definition for microgrid is, you'll probably get 10 different answers. But at the same time, there are some common features um, which, which tend to crop up um, over and over again. So those are the features that I want to just quickly talk about uh, just now. So you'll see our um, cartoon type drawing on the left-hand side of your screen. 
Um, and the first feature to point out is that connection with the wider distribution grid. Um, and pretty much all microgrids will have this clearly defined boundary, the single point of connection with that wider distribution grid, and everything downstream of that to the bottom of that represents the microgrid, and everything above that represents the, uh, the, the wider grid. Um, so, a, so a single point of contact with the grid. The second feature, a typical feature of a microgrid, is these multiple connected distributed energy resources, and that can be uh, very often solar PV systems, micro wind, um, uh, often in, in tandem with um, dispatchable backup power generation, either diesel gensets or gas engines. And increasingly, we're seeing the emergence much more of energy storage systems coming into play as well. So that's the second typical feature. The third is the different interconnected loads, which are connected to the microgrid system. They can be uh, industrial facilities. They could be commercial buildings, such as hospitals, which require critical power. They've got critical power needs. It can be residential homes, all connected uh, within this microgrid system. Fourth feature is that these all these different assets are are communicating with each other in a you know, in a controlled and optimized way, um, often to reduce your operating costs and to maximize the amount of on-site electricity that, that's generated and consumed on site, thereby you know, re reducing the operating costs for, for everyone concerned. Finally, uh, the fifth feature, microgrids can be grid connected. Uh, to the wider distribution grid, or they can be completely islanded, so no connection whatsoever, and often they can be both, such that they can island from the wider grid uh, during a, a blackout um, event in the wider distribution grid. So, so in that case, microgrids can be used to provide the grid resiliency to keep the lights on when the wider grid is out. So those are some of the, the typical features that we see uh, within microgrids. Um, but why is now the time to be looking at microgrids? Well, in our research as a business, our research contacts and our clients have been coming to us much more frequently now asking about this topic. Um, so that there's a real drive, I think, to learn much more about this space, and, and that is one of the reasons why we published um, very recently our, our microgrid study looking at the global opportunities. And um, But what is driving the space? Well, I think it's fair to say that distributed energy resources are growing globally um, in a sort of exponential, exponential manner. You can see this graph here, which shows the global installed capacity of solar PV over the last 15 or so years, and you can really see the growth there. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons why we see a growing interest in microgrids today. Um, very closely linked to that is the, the falling costs of these distributed energy resources. So solar PV costs are, are coming down, and, and we're also seeing a similar picture with energy storage. And those falling costs are increasingly enabling microgrids as a much more cost-effective solution than they were maybe five or ten years ago. Um, I mentioned grid resiliency already, and, and this is one of the, the, the key market drivers for microgrids, certainly in, in North America, for example, in the wake of um, some very high-profile um, hurricane events which have caused widespread blackouts in some of the northeastern states in North America. Um, so really that, that need for grid resiliency, for, for keeping the lights on during blackout events, that, that's one of the things that's really driving the growth toward microgrids that we're seeing today. And perhaps as a result of that, much more awareness and, and much more people asking about microgrids. Uh, and the interest is just going up and up as far as we can see. So those are just some of the reasons. that There are, are several more as well, but those, I think, are the ones that we see as being the, 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 the great enablers for microgrids today. Um, this next slide just illustrates some of the key customer segments that we see as being uh, quite a good opportunity for microgrids in, in different parts of the world. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide in, in, in too much detail just now, but ho hopefully the, uh, the, the slide is fairly self-explanatory. Um, the, the key at the bottom shows you know, what those different symbols represent, um, and the, the, the different drivers can be uh, grid resiliency, they can be reduced OPEX costs, reducing the amount of CO2 emissions, um, and different customer segments will have different, uh, different drivers um, and different reasons to invest in microgrids. Um, that's all I want to say just now in terms of setting the context. 
what I want to do next is hand over to my colleague Matt, who will talk you through uh, a case study in North America. Thanks for setting the scene, John. Before I get into the gory details of the world's perhaps most complex microgrid, I thought it would be good to start with a bit of an overview of the owners and operators of the microgrid, Encore, and then I'll also touch on the Texan electrical grid. Encore is a regulated electric utility that operates the largest distribution and transmission system in Texas, so the sixth largest in the nation, in the US, and they serve more than 10 million Texans living in 402 cities. Encore has a bit of a reputation as being one of the more progressive utilities in the way that it adopts new grid technologies and advocates for new energy legislation. Having a, a, a bit of a look at the Texan electricity grid now, Texas, unlike the rest of the US, has its own electrical grid operated independently of other states. While there are numerous interconnectors to the rest of the US grid, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT, operates the electrical grid and manages the deregulated market for about 75% of the state. The Texan grid also has a lot of renewables on it, with 20 gigawatts of wind connected to the grid, which accounted for about 15% of the electricity generated last year. The amount of installed solar is also in expected to grow rapidly given the favorable solar conditions present throughout much of the state. The large amount of intermittent renewables results in quite a bit of power, sometimes being generated when it is needed least, for example on a, say, a cool, breezy winter's night, and sometimes a lot of energy is generated when it is needed most. Think about a, a very hot summer's day when everyone in Texas has their ACs pumped to the max. This translates into very peaky electricity prices, which can sometimes even go negative, uh, like we've seen in California and Germany. And this also places other strains on the grid, which can sometimes result in overloading and regular faults to occur. So looking at the project in a bit more detail, there's no doubt that this project is a flagship project for the industry due to its complexity and also uh, the number of players involved. The microgrid was built to help alleviate the issues associated with regular grid outages, which are uh, especially costly and uh, important or relevant at this site because this, is, this campus is one of Encore's main telecommunication hubs. Additionally, the microgrid was developed as a demonstration of the benefits microgrids can provide to the distribution grid, but also to better understand the economic and regulatory aspects of operating microgrids within Texas. The microgrid itself consists of four sub-microgrids that can each be run independently or in parallel with each other and can also be connected or disconnected from the wider grid, a unique feature of this microgrid. The microgrid incorporates an advanced control system that manages the microgrid's multiple generation assets and loads based on an algorithm that is designed to reduce emissions and minimize costs while ensuring the supply of power to critical loads. The project was designed and spearheaded by SNC Electric and Schneider Electric. Most of the power electronics were provided by SNC and the system uses Schneider control software. The microgrid controller uses Schneider's structure demand side operations technology, which lowers the cost of operating the microgrid based on the economics of the different distributed energy resources, as well as by leveraging and having a real-time input from the Texan electricity market signals. It also looks at weather forecasting information, historical energy usage data, as well as, of course, real-time building energy demand. The controller aims to improve the overall system-wide microgrid efficiency while also trying to reduce emissions at all times. The microgrid also makes use of a, a Tesla battery system, a capstone gas microturbine, and a solar installation by Axiom Solar. So having a little bit more of a detailed look at how the, the microgrid works, here is a, a relatively complex electrical diagram showing the four sections of the microgrid. This is, is perhaps a bit due to, due too detailed for the purposes of this webinar, so I've uh, taken the liberty of simplifying a little bit. So as I mentioned, the microgrid consists of four different sections. 
Um, in the first section, we have a number of uh, generation assets as well as loads. The load is indicated by that building symbol icon there. And we've got in that first section, we've got some storage, solar PV, as well as that capstone gas micro turbine I was talking about earlier. In sections two and three, we have some more loads as well as diesel gen sets. And in the fourth section of the microgrid, we have further loads as well as a storage aspect. It is also important to note that there is a portion of the campus which is not supported by the microgrid as indicated by the building symbol excluded from the, the dotted microgrid outline there. Two of the four microgrids are considered non-critical and can be powered down by the Schneider controller using a specialized load shedding algorithm in order to operate the two more critical microgrid loads indefinitely, so long as there's, there's diesel and um, propane to run the, the turbine. The microgrid incorporates energy storage, as I've mentioned, which is critical for balancing the fluctuating solar, the solar PV output, and the batteries can react with a sub-second response time frame, allowing the diesel gen sets and the turbine enough tower, time to power up or down, depending on the PV installation output. The microgrid can operate at a peak output of about 900 kilowatts electrical for approximately two hours, and that's provided the solar arrays are producing at their full output and the batteries are fully charged. After two hours, uh, once the batteries are fully discharged, the microgrid will operate at a 550 kilowatt base load. Despite all the complexity, this microgrid only took nine months to design and build from concept to commissioning. So what's our, our thoughts on all of this? This is undoubtedly an example of, a, of quite a sophisticated microgrid, as we mentioned in the, the run-up to the webinar, perhaps the most sophisticated in the world. It employs multiple DERs as well as energy storage. Um, the Encore project, or this microgrid, is, is certainly a flagship microgrid project developed by two of the most advanced players, or two of some of the most advanced players in the, se the sector, Schneider and SNC. This microgrid is evidence of a utility company's interest in developing microgrids, helping them to understand the opportunities and challenges associated with the emergence of, of uh, decentralized energy and the impact this is likely to have on the utility business in the future. Furthermore, given the rapid deployment of grid-scale renewables and the effect that they have on electricity prices, as we saw earlier in, in one of the first slides I spoke to, Microgrids with storage allow a degree of energy arbitrage to take place while reducing emissions and also ensuring security of supply. That's all from me on the Encore case. Yeah, th thanks, Matt. Yeah, um, really, uh, really good example that I think of of uh, you know the, the the increasing complexities of microgrid designs and and just a real demonstration of what microgrid systems can be done and how they can support the wider grid. Um, so thanks very much for that, Matt. Um, and now I think we're going to move over to Scott, um, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the trends that we're seeing uh, towards hybridization and vertical integration within the, the, the wider energy sector. So over to you, Scott. Thanks, John. So we heard a good example there of a, of a, of a nice partnership between Schneider and SNC, but there's been a few recent developments that makes us see this definite trend towards hybridization, so diversifying into hybrid power solutions on this vertical integration, so offering everything along the value chain. So this is a, a trend as companies look to become a more of an energy solutions provider, offering the full suite of technologies, and where we think microgrids as a service are starting to become closer to reality. A recent example of this was Wurzilla's acquisition. So of Greensmith Energy. Worcella is a global energy products manufacturer. Greensmith Energy are a US, US specialist in behind the METAR, uh, front of METAR energy storage. And they're also installing this in conjunction with other assets like PV with the software to control it. Uh, also Greensmith Energy bringing their experience of microgrids as well. So what this means is that Wurzilla have obtained the capabilities of storage, of PV, of microgrids, but have also helped, uh, but also help in terms of access to the US market. While Greensmith will be will be able to um, 
uh, utilise Warzilla's connections and market access to Europe and, and other countries outside the US. There's actually some other, uh, quite a few other examples of these types of partnerships. Um, GE and so another global energy product manufacturer uh, involved in gas engines and storage with the South Korean um, conglomerate LSIS who are involved in grids, uh, infrastructure, smart grid projects as well. Um, and again looking to help GE in the South Korean market and GE obviously looking to tap into uh, the, the South Korean company's expertise on the networks and grid side. Um, another example, we heard about Schneider's um, uh, partnership already with SNC. And here they're working with the Danish company D, uh, uh, DIEF, who are a diesel genset backup so controls company. And another example is Caterpillar, so another sort of global energy product manufacturer involved in gas engines, partnering with First Solar, um, a US project developer, EPC, uh, PV installation uh, integrator company. So what does this all mean? It means that there'll be a rapidly shifting competitive environment, but with lots of opportunities. Not doing anything or not partnering and trying to do it all yourself is an obvious pitfall, as is probably trying to work with too many partners and stakeholders. So an acquisition or investment in the right company that creates a versatile hybrid solution while opening up new markets should be a winning formula. So, I mean, looking at this trend from another angle, so energy storage is a, is a separate topic for us and we've been looking at the impact we expect vertical integrated suppliers on this market and some of the storage uh, solutions are will be installed as part of a hybrid solution so this chart you're seeing is the annual installations of behind the meter uh, energy storage and uh, year by year up to 2021 and the dark orange there is the number of the amount of installations we expect by vertically integrated suppliers. So you can see this trend whereby the number of these solutions being installed will be increasingly be by these solutions offerers. And um, this obviously shows residential and commercial and industrial. Commercial and industrial is obviously more relevant for microgrids. Um, but again, you, you see the trend there uh, and the direction it's going in. So energy storage solutions are obviously an enabler of a microgrid solution um, and the trend is clear that this, this will continue to influence the market. So what else should we expect to see in terms of these uh, growth of these hybrid or vertical integrated solutions? Well, we see further acquisitions in the microgrid space. We expect to see an influx of new players from the traditional diesel or gas engine jets, gen sets industry also from controls and software multinationals, and with an increasing number of energy services offerings as well. Okay, thanks, thanks, Scott. Yeah, really interesting insight there, I think. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that graph really illustrates, you know, uh, you know the, the increases that we see and the industry sees in terms of the, you know, the role that energy storage is going to play, certainly in Europe um, in the coming years. So really exciting time, I think. Um, now, I think what we're going to do is um, have our poll, our one and only poll of this webinar. Um, so I'll hand you over now to my colleague, Matt, who will just talk you through the question and the possible answers. Yeah, thanks, John. We just wanted to make sure that you really are paying attention out there and you, you're awake, wherever you may be in the world. So uh, we'd like to ask you which of the following statements best describes your interest in microgrids? So you've got five different options here. I'll read through them quickly. Please take this time to vote. It, the, the poll should be active. Um, please take the, yeah, the opportunity. So uh, the first option is uh, that you are, your interest is understanding the threats and challenges posed to your company with the emergence of microgrids. Second option is that you, in the early stages of development, you're exploring and understand microgrids as an opportunity. Third option is that you actively engage, you, uh, they'll likely be important for your business. 
and you're perhaps currently developing a strategy or product or service related to microgrids. Uh, the fourth option is that you're in the market, uh, you have a developed strategy and you're looking for opportunities to develop and build and operate microgrids. And lastly, we've got an option for none of the above and we'd be interested to know if you answer number five, so none of the above, just put a, a quick comment in the, in the questions or comment box and just let us know where you, where you sit in this region and which, uh, what we haven't covered here in terms of your, your interest in microgrids. Okay, thanks Matt. And uh, yeah, we can see that most people have uh, provided their answers now. I think 85% of people on the line have voted, so we'll just leave it open for another 10 seconds. So if you're swithering between two or three, three or four, then quickly get your answer down and we'll close the poll and publish the results in a few seconds. So a few more seconds to get your last vote in and okay, we'll close the poll now and share the results. Okay, so you should see the results on your screen now. So I'll just quickly talk through those. Um, so 7% uh, understanding the threats or challenges, um, but most people are, uh, well, either at the early stages of being in the market or, or already already there. 29% in the early stages, um, exploring microgrids as an opportunity. 38% actively engaged. They'll certainly be important in the future. Um, and around a quarter of participants already in the market with a, a fully developed strategy. So um, really interesting to see. And, and I think that reflects our view that um, there's a lot of interest in this space, a lot of companies at fairly early stages. Um, but certainly the, the trajectory of interest is one that will see much more activity and much more players in the market over the coming years. So thanks very much for, uh, for, for um, contributing in the poll and now we'll just move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, and, and what we wanted to do now was just talk through one of the recommendations which has come out of our microgrids multi-client study. Um, and the recommendation is get your cookie cutter strategy right. Um, hopefully, you all know what a cookie cutter is, and, and there's uh, a whole bunch of them on the right hand slide there, uh, the right hand side of, of the slide. Um, so, what do we mean by this? What do we mean by get your cookie cutter strategy right? It's quite difficult to say. Um, well, microgrids can be very complex animals with a lot of moving parts. It's certainly true to say that no two microgrids are exactly the same. Today, most microgrids are designed more or less from scratch with a bespoke, tailored approach used throughout each stage of the design process. The consequence of this is that the design process itself can be extremely complex, very costly, and take a huge amount of time to get right. And of course, if you don't get the upfront microgrid design right at the start of the project, it can lead to a whole load of problems once the system is built or about once the system is being built or when it's completed and doesn't operate as intended. So what can be done to try and streamline this process? That's where the cookie cutter strategy comes into play. In simple terms, this means standardizing the design process as much as possible. So instead of designing each component part of the microgrid from scratch, this concept involves the pre-design of individual microgrid components, which can then be fitted together much like a jigsaw puzzle of individual pieces coming together to create a, a completed puzzle. The more that a microgrid developer can offer a menu of options to choose from, a choice of modular components which can be bolted together to make up a complete microgrid solution, the more it will be possible to simplify the design process, reduce costs and quicken timelines. And during the primary research we carried out for our microgrid study um, earlier this year, we spoke to a number of different companies that are working on this very approach. One such company is Schneider Electric. Uh, we mentioned them, they were involved in the Encore project that we discussed earlier. Um, but they as a company are starting to offer customers a, a menu of different options to choose from during this initial design process. For example, they've developed a microgrid control system which has the ability to communicate with a wide range of different distributed energy resources, including different energy storage systems, solar PV modules, CHP systems, and so on. And it's very important that, in this case, the microgrid control system 
uh, has the right protocols installed to be able to communicate with all the different components of the microgrid system. You know, they, they all need to be controlled and there needs to be a common language, uh, a, a common protocol between all the different assets. Um, but Schneider can offer this control system as a single plug and play type microgrid component. Um, separately, they can also offer a solution which allows the microgrid to island from the grid when the wider distribution grid goes down for whatever reason. And the control system and the grid islanding solution can be offered uh, as two individual components or as a, as a combined solution. So they've got these two, two things which can be operated, uh, installed separately or, or together. The point is that they offer um, modular solutions. Um, and Schneider aren't the only one that there are a number of different companies um, that are doing this, a similar sort of thing. So they're offering these uh, solutions which are pre-designed, which can be used to plug and play with the wider microgrid infrastructure. So the cookie, cookie cutter strategy is one recommendation which came out during the research for our for our multi-client study, um, and we have seven further recommendations which can be found in our microgrid study. And if you want to learn more about any of those recommendations, then you can very much feel free to come and speak to me or, or any of my colleagues um, uh, after the webinar. Um, so I just wanted to, we referred to the study a few times already, um, we're, we're more or less out of time, so thank you for staying with us. Um, I just wanted to introduce our, the, the study that we've recently published. Um, the core focus areas for this study is a global outlook, looking at the microgrid applications and several different case studies. Uh, we've characterized the player landscape uh, and the technology perspectives, so what role can different technologies play within a, within a microgrid system, what are the business models and value chains, where are the key markets, and how do we see the sector developing in the future. So those are the, the, the core focus areas that we looked at um, when we undertook our research. Um, and like I say, the, the, the scope is global. Um, typically, from a size point of view, we're looking at hundreds of kilowatts to tens of megawatts in terms of scale. Um, a wide range of different applications like we looked at um, earlier, um, and also a wide range of different technologies as well, including gas engines, micro turbines, fuel cells, and so on. Um, what are the, the key subscriber benefits if you were to um, subscribe to the study? Well, it helps subscribers to develop business models which can maximize A, the value to you, and B, the appeal to your customers. Helps you to, to develop the right strategy for your company. Um, we also did a market sizing exercise to understand what is the size of the microgrid market today and, and how we see that changing over the next five to ten years. Um, identifying partnership opportunities with key players in the microgrid space and helps to determine where to develop microgrid propositions and within which applications. Those are some of the key benefits. Like I said, the study is now published and available to purchase immediately. Um, this next slide just shows the, the contents page from the, from the study, um, so that gives you a bit of an indication of, of the different topics that we looked at, and well, those are the page numbers on the right-hand side, so it's a 75-plus page uh, report. Um, so that's all we wanted to talk about at this stage. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening uh, today, and... Uh, we would very much welcome the, the conversation to continue, so please feel free to get in touch with me or Scott or Matthew um, after, the, uh, after the webinar is finished. Our contact details are on your screen there. We've got just a few minutes left for questions, and we've seen a few coming in throughout the webinar. Um, so please feel free to stay for a few more minutes, and uh, we'll go through a couple of those questions now. So a number of questions that have come in, uh, and we won't have time to get through them all, I'm afraid. Um, but there's one here talking about uh, microgrids being synonymous with blockchain. So, so would it be fair to say that the concept of a microgrid is synonymous with that of a blockchain? Um, Matt, uh, I think you've looked at this, so do you want to answer that? Yeah, this is, um, thanks for the question. It's a very interesting kind of topic there, blockchain and microgrids. It's something that we, we cover in the study. Um, if you want more details there, then please have a, you know, have a look at the study. But um, yeah, the idea of a blockchain and a microgrid, there, there are two very different kind of concepts at play there. They're not one and the same. This is something that we've seen confused before in uh, the literature and what's out there. Um, although we do see a blockchain or a distributed ledger type system as perhaps being a key enabler for microgrids in the future, 
So uh, there are cases or um, there are currently places where energy is traded over a blockchain type system. As we've seen, for example, with LO3 Energy in the Brooklyn microgrid, what they term a microgrid. As I say, once again, it's a bit debatable whether or not um, that's actually a microgrid because you fail to see that common, common point of coupling with the, with, the, with the main macrogrid or the distribution grid. And so in that case, it's more, perhaps a microgrid is a bit misleading terminology in that case. I think the better way to think about it would be um, energy traded over a distributed ledger or using blockchain kind of technology. So I, I hope that kind of answers the question there. We definitely see, um, just to reiterate, um, blockchain type technology, which is a hugely complex topic within itself, um, being an enabler for, for, um, for microgrids in the future. But um, please feel free to get in contact with me um, and we can discuss this further perhaps over an e email or a call. Thanks, Matt. And uh, yeah, a few more questions that have come in. Uh, one uh, around how microgrid projects are financed. Um, and maybe I'll just quickly answer that one. But th th this is something that we looked at um, very closely, actually, within our within the microgrid study. Um, and the, there are a number of different ways. Um, you can get the the more simple type, which is the the capital sale type model, where you know the the, the customer will come to a, a microgrid developer, and and the microgrid developer will design the system, uh, install it, um, or, or deliver the components, install it, and commission it, and and then well, once the commissioning is done, then the the customer will will pay for the microgrid and own it outright. Um, perhaps the more simple type that is, um, but we're increasingly seeing. Um, PPA type models coming through as well, whereby a microgrid developer will come in and install the microgrid system, um, but the ownership will not then transfer to the end user at this point. Um, and what actually happens is that the, the customer will pay for the microgrid um, through the energy that, that, that is supplied um, from the microgrid system itself. Um, and the, the financing can either come from the microgrid developer themselves or through a third, par a third party financier. Um, who, who will, will provide the, the capital funds to develop the project. Um, but there are also looking at some um, uh, more innovative models that, that we looked at in the study as well. And I'll be happy to talk through those um, separately um, after the webinar also. Um, uh, another question, okay, it's in relation to the microgrid study, um, uh, so that's good to know, and so the question is how much does the microgrid study cost? Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, um, and it's something that we'll be very happy to discuss on an individual one-to-one -one basis after the, after the microgrid webinar today. Um, so if you, yeah, if you wish to learn more about the study or the contents or the pricing, then yeah, please get in touch with any of us. Um, um, using the details that are on the screen there just now. Um, so, uh, any more questions? Yeah, okay, so uh, we've got a number of questions here, um, but I think actually we're, we're out of time because um, it's now 22 the hour. Um, but thanks very much for all, those, all of those that have submitted questions. If we haven't managed to get to your question, uh, we will certainly follow up separately by email. Um, and also thank you very much for uh, contributing to the poll. Um, like I said at the start, the webinar has been recorded um, uh, and will be available to, available to watch afterwards. The slides, uh, we are happy to share the slides with you also. If you wish to have a copy of the slides, then please feel free to email me. Um, john.murray at delta-ee.com and I'll be happy to share with you a PDF version of the slides afterwards. So thank you very much uh, for attending today um, and yeah we wish you uh, a very good rest of the day. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.